So what I want to talk about is the, the path to a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So, so, so what is a typical vaccine timeline? Usually it's about 15 to 20 years. I mean, the, the, uh, Rick mentioned uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of the team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They created the bovine human reassortant strains that became the, the vaccine uh, Rotatec. That was a 26-year effort. That's about right. So, so if you look at, at this chart, typically what, what people do is they start off doing preclinical studies meaning they hopefully are able to create a, an experimental animal that, that suffers the signs and symptoms of the disease you're interested in. So in this case, for example, you would inoculate a Syrian hamster or a ferret who seemed to be particularly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, and then watch them develop the symptoms and signs of this disease. And then you do proof of concept studies. You see whether or not the vaccine that you think could work does work. And in addition, you get to, to look, to dissect, really to literally dissect, what part of that immune response is associated with protection against disease. So it gives you a basis to think that, that your vaccine could work and at least gives you a, 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 a sense of what kind of immune response you're looking for uh, to induce protection. So the phase one trials usually are dose ranging trials where you, you use a high, medium or lower dose to try and get a sense of, of what a dose appears to be the safest yet consistently immunogenic. Um, is the vaccine safe? Does it seem to work? Are there any serious side effects? Obviously, when you're testing 20 to 100 people, that's, you know, you're only looking for common side effects. Then when you get to the phase two, two studies, that's when you have several hundred volunteers. And what you're looking for here, now you've decided on your dose. And now you want to make sure that, that as you give this to hundreds of volunteers, that you have a consistent immune response, at least the immune response that you think is going to be associated with protection. I want to under, underline the word think because you don't know that. You could have excellent immune responses in the case of SARS-CoV-2, high titers of neutralizing antibodies, meaning antibodies that neutralize the ability of the virus to infect the cell. And still, that may not necessarily mean that the vaccine is going to be effective. I would say half the vaccines that are currently on the market today do not have a clear immunological correlate for protection. And then comes the key study, the phase three trial. This is when you, you have a large prospective placebo-controlled control, trial, typically involving tens of thousands of people who either get the vaccine or don't get the vaccine. That, is, that, that then can rule out at least relatively uncommon side effects regarding safety and can at least tell you to what extent in the short term your vaccine is effective. Now, with that in mind, remember that th this vaccine, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, will probably be developed in a year and a half, not the usual 15 to 20 years. So I think that begs the question exactly what, how can we do that? I mean, how is it possible that this timeline could be so much shorter than typical timeline? So um, there are a few things. One, there has never been more interest, more expertise, or a greater number of companies interested in making this vaccine or making a vaccine than making this vaccine. There are more than 120 investigational new drug applications that have been submitted to the Food and Drug Administration. More than 70 companies across the globe are interested. And billions and billions of dollars have been poured into this from outside resources, like BARDA, which is part of Health and Human Services, just stands for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. The World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, have given a lot of money to serve as a pull mechanism to move this, these, this, these vaccines forward. The other thing is I think that, that, that we're, we, in many cases, the, the preclinical studies are either, either don't exist or are limited. The number, the number of people in dose-ranging studies has been very small. One of the, the, the companies I'm going to talk about, Moderna, which makes a messenger RNA vaccine, really did dose-ranging studies in only about 45 people. That's much smaller than typically the, the sort of often uh, hundreds of people that are involved in dose-ranging studies with a typical vaccine development program. But remember, typical vaccine development programs are pursued by one company or two companies, not 70 companies across the globe with this much money. So it's, it's, it's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons this is so much faster. I'm actually on the NIH's active group. This was a group put together by Francis Collins to um, help, uh, it was active stands for accelerating COVID-19 technological innovations and in vaccines. So our, our purpose is to try and um, um, determine what these trials will look like. And, and we have recommended uh, a phase three trial that'll be uh, roughly 30,000 people, either 20,000 vaccinees and 10,000 placebo recipients or 15,000 vaccinees and 15,000 placebo recipients. 
Um, these, this, this group consists of uh, members of the FDA, the, the CDC, uh, academia, as well as the companies, or at least representatives from the companies who are all on these, these, uh, these meetings. And so this phase three trial should be starting this month. I mean, some, some uh, trials, phase three trials have already started. Um, for uh, phase three trials from uh, from uh, other uh, countries. The other thing, and, and this is a big difference, is is typically the Food and Drug Administration licenses vaccines. Every vaccine that has been given to people in this country since the 1950s has been licensed by the Food and Drug Administration. That's not going to happen here. And when that happens, it always goes through the FDA's uh, vaccine advisory committee, which has the fancy name. VRPAC committee, which is just Vaccine Related Biological Product Approval Committee. I'm actually on that committee. We're not going to see this, this vaccine. We aren't. It's going to be approved through something called emergency use authorization. Stephen Hahn, who is the, uh, the commissioner of, the, of the, uh, the FDA, he will decide whether or not to, to allow emergency use authorization for these vaccines. Um, and the other thing is that, that, that compresses this is that, it's that the manufacturing and scale up are in a program called Warp Speed. So, yes, yeah, sorry for this. This is the only picture I could find. I won't keep it up that long. But the, the, what, what Warp Speed is, and this is not, this is Warp Speed 3. So, so Warp Speed is ma mass producing vaccines at risk, meaning mass producing them before you know whether or not they're safe, before you know whether or not they're effective, because you haven't done a phase three trial yet. The hope is that, that when one or more of these vaccines is shown to be safe and effective, that then you will have millions or tens of millions of doses that are ready to sort of roll off the assembly line immediately and that you could give immediately. Actually, warp speed one was the polio vaccine in 1955. I mean, Jonas Salk had shown in the Pittsburgh area that he had given uh, his inactivated polio vaccine to about 700 children. The vaccine appeared to be safe. Um, the vaccine induced an excellent immune response. But we waited for a phase three trial. That trial was done in a year. It was given, the vaccine was given to 420,000 children. Again, it was placebo controlled. Uh, about 200,000 children received placebo. 1.2 million children served as observed, uninoculated control. That was a 1.8 million child study. That was the biggest uh, uh, trial of a medical product I think ever performed. Um, and the point being that we waited, that we waited for that phase three trial. Even though Jonas Salk's preliminary data looked great, we waited. And, and if you think that, that this, this particular virus is, is much more terrifying than polio, you're wrong. People were scared to death of polio in the 1950s. I mean, as many as 30,000 children were paralyzed every year or were placed in iron lungs for the rest of their lives. Um, about 1,500 died every year. Parents were scared to death. And remember, only one of every 200 children with polio were paralyzed by it. So those 30,000 uh, cases of paralysis represented closer to 6 million cases of, of infection. So, but we waited. And I, I say that only because, you know, we're approaching a, uh, an election at the beginning of November. And I do worry that when there are tens of millions of doses of, of this, these vaccines available in warp speed, that there would be a temptation to reach for the administration to reach their hand into the warp speed bucket before we completed a phase three trial to show that these vaccines are safe and effective and say, look, we've got you know, a vaccine that appears to be safe in thousands of people. Um, you know, the immune responses look, look excellent. So let's, let's get this out there. I really hope that doesn't happen, what I would call the October surprise. That is all up to Stephen Hahn. He, he, he's the main guy. As long as he doesn't approve any of these vaccines under the emergency use authorization until there, is, uh, there, there are, are clear data that is the, by a, in a phase three trial that these vaccines work and are safe, then we're fine. All right, so we'll start with the virus. So there are seven human coronaviruses. Four of them are, are common. There are two are alpha, two are beta coronaviruses. They circulate every year in the United States. I'd say about 15 to 20 percent of the respiratory infections that come into Children's Hospital of Philadelphia every year are caused by one of these uh, strains of human coronavirus. There are three novel human coronaviruses, all of which are uh, beta uh, coronaviruses. The first to emerge, by novel, I mean that, that no one had ever seen uh, any of these viruses before, therefore they had pandemic uh, potential. The first was SARS-CoV-1, which sort of raised its head in 2002 and disappeared by 2004. Um, the second was MERS-CoV, which still circulates uh, to, to some small extent and raised its head in around 2012. What was different about these two viruses as compared to SARS-CoV-2 is that when you were infected with SARS-CoV-1 or MERS-CoV, 
you were pretty sick. You had moderate to severe infection. There wasn't this kind of spread via uh, with an asymptomatic infection or spread with a mildly symptomatic infection. So it was much easier to sort of put a moat around these viruses and stop their spread than it has been for SARS-CoV-2, where frankly 80% of the cases are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and 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 still capable of spreading, which has made it much harder than to uh, to to try and to try to put a moat around uh, this particular virus. Now the illness the illness is called COVID-19, which just means coronavirus disease 2019, and the virus's name is SARS-CoV-2, which is much closer to SARS-CoV than MERS. Um, this is the basic structure of this virus. It's a single-stranded positive sense uh, RNA virus, meaning that its its uh, genome is messenger RNA, like rubella virus. Um, it's the genomes range from 25 to 32 kilobases. It's a small virus, and there's only four proteins. The spike protein, which is the key protein, that's the protein that attaches the virus to cell. There is a, um, a part of that protein called the receptor binding domain. Antibodies directed against that particular part of the spike protein uh, will pre prevent the virus from binding to cells. Therefore, it will prevent the virus from infecting cells or, said another way, prevent the virus from infecting you. So that's also the good news about this virus. You know the protein you're interested in. You're interested in, in, in preventing virus binding. Therefore, you're interested in inducing an antibody response, a T helper dependent, T helper cell dependent antibody response against that spike protein. The other three proteins are shown here as the nucleocapsid protein, which is associated with the virus's genome, the membrane protein, and then the envelope protein. Okay, so again, it's the spike protein that you're interested in. This just shows you the uh, picture of the virus, which um, is called a coronavirus because it looks like a crown. Okay, so the vaccine strategies that are used to make, uh, that are used, that are being pursued are shown on this slide. Um, which is basically every strategy that has ever been used to make a vaccine before, as well as several strategies that have never been used to make a vaccine. So we'll go through each one of them. First is whole killed virus. So there are commercial counterparts for a whole killed viral vaccine. The inactivated polio vaccine, the hepatitis A vaccine, and the rabies vaccines are all whole killed viruses. The problem that's come up with, the, the thing that people worry about it are two events that occurred in the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was an attempt to make a vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus, which is a common uh, uh, infection in children. It accounts for about 5,000 respiratory deaths a year, primarily in infants and young children. And so the NIH group made a vaccine by taking RSV and inactivating it with the chemical formaldehyde. What they found was the children who got that vaccine, when then confronted with natural or wild type circulating RSV, did worse than children who'd never gotten the vaccine. I'll explain why in a second. In other words, those children who were vaccinated were more likely to develop pneumonia, more likely to be hospitalized, and more likely to die than children who'd never gotten an RSV vaccine. The same thing happened with the measles vaccine, also in the 1960s. In 1963, there was a whole killed measles virus vaccine that was introduced. And again, children who got that vaccine were worse off than when they were then exposed to natural measles than children who never got that vaccine. And again, they had the disease was called atypical measles. Um, it had an unusual rash, and it also was associated with an increased incidence of pneumonia. What these two viruses have in common, both RSV and measles, is the way that they attach to cells and enter cells is they fuse to the cells, and they fuse via a surface protein, the fusion protein. Um, the reason that that's relevant is that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is also a fusion protein. So, so that that's in the back of everybody who's working on this the, this vaccine's minds is is the fact is uh, these two experiences in the 1960s. Now, this is this vaccine, a whole killed uh, viral vaccine, is being pursued by a group in China. They are choosing not to use formaldehyde, which was used for the RSV and measles vaccine, which I think was wise. Rather, the using beta propiolactone as an activating agent, um, which is used to make the rabies vaccine. The rabies vaccine, by the way, that was developed here at the Wistar Institute by Tad Victor and his coworker. Okay, the second approach is to use a live attenuated viral vaccine. So that is the current strategy that's used to make the measles vaccine, the mumps vaccine, the rubella vaccine, the varicella or chickenpox vaccine, and one of the rotavirus vaccines. That strat that this, if you had to pick a strategy among all the ones that I've shown that will take the longest to, to develop, it was it's this one. 
because you have to really just by trial and error that you attenuate to make sure that the the virus isn't too attenuated um, uh, or isn't uh, or isn't attenuated enough, and that that takes time. It takes really years, I think, to make to take this kind of approach. But it is being pursued by a company called Codagenics in Farmingdale, New York, in collaboration with the Serum Institute of India, which, by the way, is the answer to the question: What is the biggest vaccine maker in the world? It's the Serum Institute of, of India. The third strategy is to use a purified viral protein. In other words, in this case, we know the protein we're interested in. It's that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Now, that's the strategy that's currently used to make the hepatitis B vaccine, which is just hepatitis B surface antigen, the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is just the human papillomavirus L1 protein, both of which are just surface proteins that bind the virus to cells. And then one of the influenza vaccines, uh, flu block, which is uh, made um, uh, also as a uh, as a, a subunit vaccine. Just it's just it's actually just the influenza hemagglutinin, which is also the protein of influenza that's associated with binding the virus to cells. This vaccine is being pursued by Novavax and Sanofi Pasteur. It was just I think yesterday that Novavax received 1.6 billion dollars from Warp Speed to now become one of six Warp Speed vaccines that are being mass produced, and they're. Uh, and I'll, t- I'll tell you exactly how they make uh, that vaccine. But the, the, again, the spike protein is synthesized either using a yeast or a baclovirus expression system. This just shows the yeast expression system that's used to make the human papillomavirus vaccine. What you do is you take the gene that codes for the surface protein of human papillomavirus, which is the L1 gene, you insert it into a yeast plasmid. You then take that yeast plasmid and transfect it into a yeast cell. The yeast cells that are used to make HPV vaccine and the hepatitis B vaccine are just common baker's yeast. Um, as, as then that yeast cell uh, um, uh, reproduces itself, that uh, plasmid then makes that protein, the L1 protein, which actually assembles itself into a virus-like particle. I mean, interestingly, if you look at the, um, the HPV vaccine under the electron microscope, it looks just like HPV. Um, the only difference, obviously, is it doesn't contain viral genomes, so it can't possibly uh, reproduce itself. Of interest, people often complain about the fact that the HPV vaccine hurts when you get it, and there's a reason for that. The reason is is that when the, the HPV vaccine uh, L1 protein is made, it's actually made in the nucleus of the cell, not in the cytoplasm. So it's sort of hard to get the that uh, those empty viral capsules or so-called viral-like particles out of the nucleus easily, so rather to do that, um, you need a fairly high salt resin. So the reason that vaccine stings is it's 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 salty. So it's, it's putting salt into the wound. There, there's a fact that is completely useless that you'll never use again, but it's yours. Okay, the other way that in which these purified proteins are made are using the baclovirus expression system. So the baclovirus are essentially an insect virus into which then you clone the gene that you're interested in. In this case, it's a spike protein. This is what uh, this is what Novavax is doing. And it's what is, was done to make the recombinant hemagglutination, hemagglutinin vaccine known as flu block, which has been on the market now for a few years. So you just basically take this engineered baclovirus, you infect insect cells, these butterfly cells called Spadopterus fugiperta cells, and then you sort of grow this up. You can see in the vat there, and then you get uh, you have your purified protein. So um, the good news about this approach, and, and I, I like it that, that Warp Speed now includes the Novavax product because at least we have experience with the Novavax product. At least we have, you know, with the Novavax kind of a product, which is to say a purified protein vaccine. Because you, you see, as we move forward, um, we're going to move into uh, strategies for which there are no current commercial equivalents in the United States. Or said another way, we have very, we have no experience with these uh, with these particular products. Okay, so the next would be replicating viral vectors. So this, the, this is currently used, these stra- this strategy is currently used to make the dengue vaccine and one of the Ebola vaccines. Um, to make the, this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, Merck is one of the companies that's interested in doing that, and there, theirs is one of the now six products that is being mass produced in warp speed, although they're still fairly early in trials. So what you do here is again, it's the same strategy. You take Ebola virus, you take sorry, this a vesicular stomatitis virus, which is really not a human pathogen. So although it reproduces itself in humans, it doesn't cause disease. And then you clone into that the gene that codes for the the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And as the virus reproduces itself, it then makes that protein, and then in you, and then you make an antibody to that spike protein uh, while that that uh, 
vesicular stomatitis virus is reproducing itself. Now, this is there's there's experience for this. This is the way that Merck made its Ebola virus vaccine. So we have a fair amount of experience, at least with this vaccine in West Africa, um, and know that, it, that at least what its safety profile is and what its immunogenicity profile is. But again, we don't know that yet for the VSV uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine. We'll learn that over time. The other vaccine, and this is also, this is a licensed vaccine actually in the United States, although um, it, to prevent uh, dengue, which is a, a disease uh, in, primarily in Puerto Rico. So it's licensed primarily for uh, for use in Puerto Rico. But the way that they that they made this vaccine, again, it's the replicating vector. The replicating virus is yellow fever vaccine. And so they take the yellow fever vaccine and then genetically engineer it to include the pre-membrane and envelope region of, of dengue for each of the different dengue serotypes, types one, two, three, and four. So that's another replicating viral vector vaccine for which there is experience, um, although not really in the continental United States. Okay, then, then we move into, uh, into three strategies for which there are no commercially available vaccines. We'll start with the replication defective uh, viral vectors. So, and these are all adenoviruses. So, so um, as you can see on the left, adenovirus is a virus that causes a variety of, of, uh, of diseases, um, probably most commonly the common cold. But it, it, it's, it's, you know, the virus uh, reproduces itself in cells. And you can see on the left-hand portion of that slide, then the virus is made in cells and then um, affects other cells. That's not what the replication defective vector is. The replication defective virus can't reproduce itself. It can't make new adenovirus particles. What it can do, however, is when genetically engineered, it can make the protein, the, the coronavirus spike protein, which you see then as the, the cell in which this virus has been infected, this virus infects, now is making um, the, the gene you're interested, making the protein that you're interested in, but not making infectious virus. So this, this is a strategy that's being pursued, and this is really at the heart of a number of warp speed vaccines. So it's the, the one one is a, is a is a Chinese uh, uh, product called made by CanSino Biologics. It's called it's a replication defective adenovirus type five. They've completed preclinical studies in phase one and phase two. They haven't done a phase three trial. Nonetheless, the, this the Chinese government has decided to administer this vaccine to its military. At least if they've done a phase three trial, they, there's no either press release or publication about it. So so I'm not sure. Um, the one of the problems with adenovirus type five is that it's common. Uh, it's commonly, commonly circulated. So when, when they did at least the, uh, the uh, studies that they did publish, and I'll show you that in a second, they, um, they really uh, um, didn't include anybody who already had antibodies to adenovirus type 5, um, which, which would have neutralized their, uh, their um, replication defective adenovirus type 5's ability to, to uh, make that protein. So I give, I give the Chinese group credit. They were the first group to actually publish a paper in a scientific or medical journal. I mean, up to that point, um, the, it was science by press release. And it's very frustrating, actually. I mean, a number of these companies did this. AstraZeneca did it with the, the, the UK product, which I'll get to. And um, certainly Moderna has done it. And it's just, it's just frustrating uh, uh, that, that, uh, that we're not playing by the rules. I think it would be nice to, to, that, that, that instead of seeing a press release, that we see data in published form, because otherwise you're just kind of reading the tea leaves. And so this, this paper is the is the ad five vector COVID-19 vaccine. And what it showed was that um, the immune neutralizing antibodies were, were, um, were, were decent, but not great. And they were variable. And then there was a, a sort of a, fir a, a first dose side effect problem for what was a two dose vaccine um, with fever. Then another replication defect of adenovirus is adenovirus 26. This is the current, current, a current platform that's used by, for one of the Ebola vaccines that's made by Johnson & Johnson or Janssen Pharmaceuticals. They've completed preclinical studies in phase one or phase two trials, and they are two RA warp speed finalists. The advantage of this virus is that it doesn't commonly circulate in the human population. Therefore, people won't have pre-existing antibodies or much less likely to have pre-existing antibodies against adenovirus 26. So that's an advantage over the AD5 replication defective vector. This is being pursued by AstraZeneca in collaboration with the Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford in the UK. Um, this group loves to be on television. <laughs> They're often on television talking about how, you know, they've, they, they, they've, you know, that the vaccine is safe and effective, you know, which are comments that they invariably have to uh, pull back on because you don't know whether it's effective since it's never been in a phase three trial. But they have completed uh, preclinical studies and phase one and phase two trials, and they, too, are warp speed finalists. So next is, is, uh, is messenger RNA vaccines. Um, 
This, the, this strategy is pursued by uh, two companies, Moderna and Pfizer, among others. They've completed preclinical studies and phase one and to some extent phase two trials. Um, the, these, both of these vaccines are warp speed finalists. So you see that, that you have um, two replication defective adenoviruses, one uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, the Merck product, and then you have these two. So that's the five that make up warp speed vaccines. And then yesterday, Novavax was added, which became then the first vaccine for which we actually have a strategy that's been used for commercial products. And so now there are, are six vaccines that are part of warp speed. Um, the problem with mRNA vaccines is, is M messenger RNA is labile. I mean, the good news is it breaks down very quickly in the body, so I think it's not going to be a safety issue. The bad news is it breaks down very quickly outside the body, so you have to stabilize it. It's stabilized with a complex lipid delivery system, which is not so easy to scale up. And I think that's why uh, Moderna seems to be stumbling a little bit. They were supposed to start um, their phase three trial this week, but now it's been delayed till the end of the month. They haven't said why uh, there's a delay, but um, it's hard to know. <coughs> Excuse me. So with messenger RNA, and this is it's a cool strategy. I mean, and, and it will be interesting to see as we move forward um, how this all plays out. The the I really do think at the very least we're going to learn a lot about how these new strategies work and whether they work and and whether they can apply, be applied to other vaccines. I think that will be one of the many things I think we learn out of all this. And, some ways, I'm sure, the hard way. But but here, the way this works is you take the messenger RNA that codes for the uh, coronavirus spike protein, um, and then you you, um, you you basically just inject that into into muscle cells. You can see at the top where then that that messenger RNA is translated into a protein, or it can be taken up by specialized antigen presenting cells and lymph nodes like um, uh, macrophages or dendritic cells, and then a protein is made. And the preliminary data um, look good. This this is a, the second publication in a in a medical or scientific journal. It was actually Pfizer's vaccine, and they had excellent immune responses. Uh, and they had neutralizing antibody titers that were consistent and compared very favorably to the neutralizing antibody titers that were generated after natural infection. So um, it's all good. They did have a first dose side effect problem. About 50% of people who got the middle or higher dose had fever, and then the symptoms that are associated with fever, like headache, chills, muscle aches. But again, I, I think a small price to pay for a virus that's killing as many as 1,000 people every day in the United States. And then lastly, DNA, a DNA vaccine pursued by Inovio, which I'm sure many of you know, it's a Plymouth meeting, Pennsylvania company. Um, they've completed preclinical studies in phase one and phase two. Um, DNA always has the challenge of, of trying to get DNA into cells, which can only be done by sort of making cells more permeable by electroporation. They, I think they, too, have recently become a warp speed finalist, um, is my understanding. But that's what electroporation looks like, the sort of vaccine gun. So I think, um, I think there, there's, um, when this, these vaccines come out, and I do think that we'll have one or more vaccines that will be available by either early next year or the middle of next year, I think we need to manage expectations. Um, regarding safety, I think that when we've tested a vaccine, for example, in a phase three trial of 20,000 people, um, that's not 20 million people. Uh, and, and there may be rare adverse events that are, that are only going to be picked up post licensure, which frankly is tr true of any medical product. Regarding efficacy, I think what we may find and likely will find is that the protection is short lived and incomplete, meaning that you're protected for a few years, but not for decades, and that the protection is incomplete, meaning you're protected against moderate to severe disease, but not protected against uh, um, either asymptomatic uh, infection upon exposure or mildly symptomatic infection. And that's what you would expect, I guess, from what we find with human coronaviruses. I think we're probably not going to do better than that. And then regarding availability, which groups are the highest priority? So I'm going to get to that in second. But I, I think this is really important. I, I think when these vaccines come out, we have to really make it clear to people what they can expect, um, what they what these vaccines can do and what they may not do. Um, because I think that vaccine confidence in this country is fragile. And and um, and if we put a vaccine out there um, which is underperforms either in efficacy or safety, um, I think we'll shake that confidence. It's an opportunity. I think this, this story is going to end up one of two ways. Either one, it's going to end up the way that the movie Contagion ended up, which is that vaccines become a hero and people can't wait to line up to get it. Or two, that we would shake a confidence that, uh, that is fragile. Okay, so regarding safety, uh, the good news is there are systems in place that can detect rare adverse events post-licensure, in this case, post-approval, because these aren't going to be licensed products. And they're shown sort of in the middle of this slide, the vaccine safety data link, 
and the post-licensure rapid immunization safety monitoring system, so-called PRISM system. The vaccine safety data link represents a, a linked computerized medical records uh, system that involves about 24 million people in the country. So when the vaccine is, is released, there are going to be people who, who get it and people who don't get it. And you can tell whether or not there's something that seems to come up in those people who are getting vaccines as compared to those who aren't getting vaccines. The PRISM system, then the VSD, Vaccine Safety Data Link, is, is uh, directed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The PRISM system is directed by the FDA and can analyze healthcare information from more than 190 million people. These, these systems have been able to pick up events, adverse events, as rare as one in a million. For example, Guillain-Barre syndrome occasionally pops up as a consequence of influenza vaccine at the level of roughly one in a million people. So we would be able to pick that up. So I think people need to know that, that when a vaccine rolls out, that, that isn't the end of the story, that we're still continuing to look for these for vaccine safety uh, um, post-licensure, in this case, post-approval. Regarding efficacy, um, this will be interesting too. I think um, the question is, what level of, of uh, immunization, what percentage of the population will need to be immunized to stop spread? I mean, that's what we want, right? I mean, when the vaccine comes out, this, the virus is not going to stop spreading the next day. I mean, you're going to have to immunize a lot of people. The question is how many? There's a great chapter in the, the book Plotkin's Vaccine called Community Immunity, which talks about how the following formula that I'm going to explain to you is derived. But basically, herd immunity is dependent on two factors. One is the r naught which is the, um, the transmissibility or contagiousness of the virus, and the second is vaccine efficacy. By contagiousness, what I mean is that if you have an R0 of two, that means that, that if you're infected and you have your typical day, and your typical day includes running into people, uh, none at all of whom are susceptible, then you'll infect two other people. For a virus like uh, uh, um, this, the estimated R0 is around two. The, for a highly contagious virus like measles, the R0 is around is closer to 20. So in any case, the, the formula <coughs> is R0 minus 1 over, over, R, over R0 divided by percent vaccine efficacy. So for example, if the R0 is 2 and the vaccine is efficacy is 75%, which I think is reasonable. I mean, Tony Fauci said this the other day, that he thinks we can achieve 75% efficacy, and I agree. I think we can too. The, the FDA has put out that they want to, they will not approve a product that has less than 50% efficacy, which unfortunately got picked up by the media as that's what the efficacy was going to be. I, I do think we can do better than that. But in any case, so if we go by the formula, two minus one divided by two equals 0.5. If you divide that by 0.75, that equals 0.67, which means that if we have a, an assumed R0 of two and a vaccine efficacy of 75%, we would have to immunize about 67% of the population with, with what is likely going to be a two-dose vaccine. I, I think the only vaccine that wouldn't be a two-dose vaccine, frankly, would be the live attenuated viral vaccine, which is not uh, something that's going to come out soon. So I think we're talking about giving two doses to two thirds of the population, if this is correct. And you know, you're talking about now, um, uh, you know, a population of 300 million people. So you're talking about 400 to 500 million doses. If, if for example, the vaccine efficacy was, was 100%, which no vaccine is, then 50% of the population would need to be immunized. If the vaccine efficacy was 50%, then 100% of the population would need to be immunized. And these these are sort of these are sort of hard numbers, but it's much greater than that because if you have a vaccine that lay, let's say is effective against moderate to severe disease, but isn't particularly effective against uh, asymptomatic uh, infection or mildly symptomatic infection, where one could still spread, um, then that's a problem. So and usually when we we talk about efficacy, we'll say protection against moderate to severe disease. So that's something to pay attention to. Regarding availability, uh, a few weeks ago or two weeks ago, the um, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices met. This is actually their slide. And I, I, I'd like to think they're the ones who are going to determine who gets this vaccine first, because, you know, we're not going to have a vaccine that would be available for the entire population. And um, so what they they came up with is, you can see on the right, that the first groups to be immunized would be healthcare personnel, essential workers, um, adults age greater than or equal to 65, um, long-term care facility residents, persons with high-risk medical conditions is how they see it, which would be roughly 122 million people. You know, this is my last slide, but I'm going to just to close, with, close with this thought. Um, we have a novel coronavirus, a bat coronavirus, that has just made its debut in the human population. Um, there are already a number of 
big surprises. I, I mean, no one would have anticipated that this virus would cause loss of taste and loss of smell that could last for a long period of time. Human coronaviruses don't appear to do that. Um, I think no one would have anticipated that it would spread the, in the manner that it spreads. I mean, we're into the summer. It's hot and humid in the areas where this, this virus is still spreading. That is not typical of respiratory viruses, especially envelope respiratory viruses that spread by small droplets. Usually they disappear in the summer. This didn't disappear. You have this unusual disease that it caused, causes in children, this so-called MISC disease, which is sort of similar to Kawasaki, similar to toxic shock syndrome. Um, but clearly in many ways distinguishable from them. Um, we have a number of children in our hospital now that have this disease. That's also not a consequence of human coronavirus. And then there's some, some sort of weirder things. I mean, it, it causes this, it obviously affects endothelial cells, the cells that line vessels, and can cause this hyperclotting syndrome, um, which can even be associated with things like strokes, which is, again, not something human coronaviruses do. And then for any virologists who are listening, um, this was uh, for those who listened to This Week in Virology, John Udell, who's head of virus research at, at National Institutes of Health, brought up a couple interesting things. And actually, Susan Weiss, if you're listening, I've heard you on This Week in, in, vir in uh, Virology with uh, Vince Racaniello. But um, what, what happens with this virus is that there are many people who, who get infected and, and are sick that really never develop neutralizing antibodies, which, which is odd. Uh, you know, that, that, that spike protein is abundantly present on the surface of the virus. That receptor binding domain is abundantly present on the surface of that virus. Why is it that you're not developing a neutralizing antibody response? And he raised the question that there may be an immune suppressive component to this virus, which is something certainly worth following up on. And then one other thing, and again, this is for anybody who's, who's sort of deep in the weeds on the virology part, you usually shed infectious virus for about five, six, seven days, but you can be PCR positive for weeks. I mean, the longest, I think, PCR positivity has been for 12 weeks. So what is PCR detecting? PCR is polymerase chain reaction. It's detecting viral genomes. Specifically, it's detecting messenger RNA. Well, messenger RNA is not a long-lived molecule. I mean, it shouldn't last very long on mucosal surface, surfaces, and that begs the question about whether or not um, this virus is just continuing to make messenger RNA, but not whole virus, which is odd. I can't think of a reason why it would do that, but it seems to do that. So already there's all these surprises from this virus that's only been out there about seven or eight months. We are going to be meeting this with, with a number of vaccine strategies in work speed that have never been used as commercial products before. I mean, you know, what could go wrong? I, I think we need to be open-minded to the fact that, that we are going to learn some things over the next year or two that we wish we'd known now. Um, and, and that's why this sort of science by press release, these really, um, you know, sort of chest-thumping press releases about how amazing some of the early data are on this bothers me. The, the, you know, nature gives itself up uh, slowly, grudgingly, and often with a human price. And I really wish people who put out these press releases would be a little more humble, because I predict there are going to be things we learn in the future that we wish we learned now. But that's, that's just a dark thing that I thought I'd say at the end. See, this is what older people do. They say things that are dark. So in any case, so thanks for your attention, and um, I'll take any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Paul. Let's give Paul a virtual round of applause um, for, for such an interesting and exciting lecture. Um, so uh, for folks who'd like to ask questions, um, please use the question and the answer in the chat box, and I'll try to relay them. And we'll use the same formula this afternoon. Please uh, write out your questions, and we'll try to distill them and, and ask, ask them to the speaker. Um, so Jim Hoxie asked, um, how worried are you about antibody enhancement of infection and then the durability of resp immune responses after vaccination? So two questions. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll answer the second question first. I, I think the durability would be based on sort of human coronavirus studies, where, which were human challenge studies years ago. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, 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 the protection should last certainly at least a year based on those studies, and I would imagine a few years if I had to make a guess. But again, it's a guess. I mean, because some, you know, certainly in some studies, uh, immunity seems to be shorter lived than that, at least neutralizing antibodies. I do, I mean, the, the incubation period looks to be about five or six days. I mean, that's enough time for activation and differentiation, differentiation of memory cells to become antibody producing cells which may be enough time to at least affect um, 
you know, to, to prevent moderate to severe disease, if not mild disease associated with reinfection. So, I mean, I take some hope in that, that, that even in, in the absence of circulating antibodies, that memory cells may still have an impact on this disease. So I'm going to guess a few years. In terms of antibody-dependent enhancement, which is what we saw with the dengue vaccine, I mean, there what happened is, is that um, you want to make sure that you induce neutralizing antibodies and that the neutralizing antibodies that you generate are longer lived and higher titer than binding antibodies because the binding antibodies could bind to the virus, not neutralize it, and still bring it into cells in, in the sort of Trojan horse manner, and thus actually worsen disease, which is what happened with the dengue vaccine. Children who, who, who didn't get the dengue vaccine were, were better off than children who got the dengue vaccine. They suffered actually a worse infection. But that's, that's sort of unique to dengue. Dengue is, dengue is weird that way. The second infection is often a much worse so-called so dengue hemorrhagic shock syndrome. So I'm not worried about that as the antibody-dependent enhancement as much as I'm worried about the, the stuff that was seen with RSV and measles. Um, you know, if you, if you, you have to make sure that, and with, for example, the mRNA vaccine, that it's in its pre-fusion state. It can't be in its post-fusion state, because I think that's what got us in trouble with the measles and RSV vaccines. And certainly NIAID, you know, Tony, Fauci, you know, who provided that construct to Moderna. I think that's why he, when he, occasionally he mentions RNA, mRNA vaccines, he usually says Moderna, even though Pfizer also has an mRNA vaccine. Um, I think it's because they provided that construct. He, he made sure, you know, to provide that pre-fusion construct. Um, Novavax got into trouble with an RSV vaccine, um, which, which everybody had high hopes for, that came crashing down in phase three, again, because of that same problem with not having the, the right pre-fusion configuration. So that's actually what worries me more. In this NIH active group, there is a subcommittee on sort of the immune-induced enhancement um, that has, that's going to be putting out a white paper, and then we're going to write sort of a one or two-pager for the general public about things we are worried about with regard to this vaccine that we are going to be looking for in this vaccine, probably post-approval, uh, post because it would be, I suspect, rare enough that it may not be seen uh, pre-approval. I should make one other point, just for any pediatricians that are on the line, that children will not be studied in these, um, in these phase three um, trials that are going to start in July, because they're, they're generally a low-risk group, and they're probably going to be studied uh, post-approval. Thank you very much. Um, Charlotte Kearns asks, has there been any consideration of delivery method? Can any of these vaccines be delivered nasally, orally, other means? Yes, so there are groups that are working on both nasal and oral vaccines. And um, and so, yes, I think that that is, that is something that people are interested in doing. I, th I think, frankly, every possible idea that, that could be pursued is being pursued. I mean, just at different stages. I mean, the, the warp speed are obviously the farthest ahead. That Those are the ones that if they're shown to be um, safe and effective in phase three trials, they're the first ones that are going to roll out. But I think, and I do think it's fair to say, and I don't think this is a leap, that the first vaccines, the fastest vaccines, aren't necessarily going to be the best vaccines. The reason that they're, 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 they're the ones is they're, they're, they're so-called genetic vaccines, if you will. I mean, they're plug-and-play vaccines. Once you knew, you knew the gene sequence of the spike protein, you just plug it into a replication defective vector. You just plug it into mRNA. Just plug it into DNA. Just plug it into the vesicular stomatitis. It's easy to make. And so that's why they're the fastest making. They're fairly easy to scale up. So I think that's why you're seeing them first, not ne necessarily because there's anything about those vaccines that, that make them more likely to be safe or more likely to be effective to prevent this pathogen than the other strategies. It's just that they're the fastest to make. So that kind of gets to a question I had. Um, you may not want to answer this, but if you were a betting man, what would you bet on? Uh, what uh, Do you have any... Any personal guess about what's going to be the the best, or does it get to this uh, hubris, lack of humility thing? Uh, do you, what, what would you gamble on? Okay, I'm going to answer this question honestly. I have no idea. It's it's a novel pathogen. I am open minded to the fact that that any or all or none of these vaccine strategies are going to work well. I don't know. I mean, this virus has been so surprising at so many levels that I'm going to choose to say I have no idea which will work best. The only thing I'm urging, and I wrote an op-ed piece with Zeke Emanuel a few weeks ago that was published in the New York Times, is just urging to do a phase three trial and, and, and on these vaccines. Do that. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Phase three trials are the pudding. And, um, and we have to have that. And I do worry with, with what happened with hydroxychloroquine, which was sort of FDA approved for treatment when there was no evidence that it worked, when it didn't make, frankly, a lot of sense, biological sense that it would work, that we now know from, from prospective uh, uh, placebo control trials that it didn't work and that 10% of people had a problem, you know, with cardiac toxicity, arrhythmias. But that was the FDA at its worst. 
And that was the EUA not working for us. I think that the FDA was bullied by the administration to release uh, uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine because the administration wanted this all to go away. And they saw that as a way to make it all go away. And even though it obviously wasn't do phase three trials, because I'm, you know, it's it's I have talked to the Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Oversight Committee and, and a group of a large group of Democratic senators urging them in committee hearings to ask Steve Hahn the question, are you holding this to phase three trials? And he did at a recent meeting, oversight meeting, did say the word effective. So I, the only way you can see whether something's effective is to see uh, is to do a phase three trial. So I just hope he means it. Um, I hope he means it because he's the guy. Thanks. Um, Michael Malone asked, as many vaccines don't induce the same response in older individuals, who will key, who will be likely key uh, priority groups? Uh, do you expect the phase three studies will include enough of these groups to assess efficacy? And more broadly, how do you expect to, to, to test and validate in older individuals? Right. Well, as an older individual, um, I can tell you that <laughs> definitely included in the in these phase three trials. I mean, we have now talked about sort of, you know, you want to make sure with any vaccine, you have a representative population of the American public, they, 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 a representative population of African-Americans, of Latinx Americans, of, of uh, Asian Americans, et cetera. So that, that, you know, you have a broad genetic group, but especially uh, older Americans. I mean, th this is this is the group, especially with comorbidities that are most likely to die. I mean, I think I think that, that and so and so we'll see. But I think that if I had to pick the kind of vaccine that I, I think would work. I mean, look at the flu vaccine, for example, in those over 65. It doesn't work very well. Even the high dose and squalene adjuvanted flu vaccines don't work particularly well in people who are older. But but I'm really encouraged by the Shingrix vaccine. I mean, there's a vaccine that's a subunit vaccine. It's only the glycoprotein E of uh, varicella zoster virus that works better than Zostavax, which is a live attenuated viral vaccine. I think it's the first time in history, in medical history, that a, a subunit vaccine works better than a live attenuated viral vaccine. And the reason is two powerful adjuvants, you know, monophospholipid A and, and QS21. That in combination with, I think, you know, the uh, Heplosab B has this CPG motif, which is just cytosine. Uh, guanine uh, uh, linked with a uh, with a phosphodiester linkage. I mean, all of these these uh, these uh, are, are toll-like receptor agonists. So, in the case of monophospholipid A, TLR4. Um, in the case of uh, CPG motif, T TLR9. So, I, I have a lot of hope for that kind of vaccine. I mean, you you look at the the efficacy of Shingrix in in people who are over 70. It's like 90% effective. Nothing works that well in people that age. So, I'm really encouraged that. Uh, that that would be the way to go for an older American. And there certainly are groups working on it. Thank you. Um, sort of a related question from Mindy White, which approaches are best for people with compromised immune system? Uh, what would be safe and effective for the immunocompromised? Right, so you'd want to stay away from a live attenuated viral vaccine. You'd probably want to stay away from, from even from a replicating viral vector vaccine. Um, but the others, you know, which don't replicate or, you know, in the case of the purified protein or inactivated vi vaccines, I mean, those, you know, those are, we have examples for that now where uh, people who are immune compromised can get those vaccines safely. I mean, they may not be as immunogenic in someone who's immune competent, but um, certainly the safety issue, which is always the first issue, they can receive that. So I would stay away, obviously, from 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 something like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the vesicular stomatitis virus vaccine or any live attenuated viral vaccine. Thanks. Um, your colleague Jeff Bergelson asked, is there long lasting immunity after infection with regular coronaviruses? Right. So all we have, hi, Jeff, how have you been? Um, <laughs> all we have are, are data from, I think, from like 1990 when there was a, a human challenge trial with human coronavirus. You probably remember these studies. Um, and unfortunately, that was just studied a year later. They found that there was protection against against actually mild and moderate and severe disease when challenged with that virus a year after knowing that person had been affected with the same serotype. We don't have other data um, to, to really answer that question. Um, I'm I'm choosing to believe that that a year was the minimum and that it would be at least a few years. But no, we don't know. We'll find out. So uh, a technical question from Stu Isaacs. For the subunit vaccine approach with spike protein, does it self-assemble into a virus-like particle or for a rosette like the ones you described? And parentheses, not, thank you for a great talk. <laughs> oh, thanks. Not to my knowledge. I don't think so. The, the hepatitis B and, and HPV tend to do that. Uh, to my knowledge, no. 
And so just following up on something you said earlier about uh, enhancing infection with dengue, bi binding antibodies versus neutralizing antibodies, um, do, do we know anything about how to tune an immune response to be more neutralizing, less binding? Is that something you can engineer, or is there any background there on how to how to avoid unwanted binding antibodies uh, and dodge enhancing infection? Well, you, you can certainly test for it. I mean, I think that, and that's what you would have to do. You know, I think what 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 you know when when the dengue vaccine was made, you know, with this yellow fever 17D as as the backbone. I mean, they induce neutralizing antibodies, and and those neutralizing antibodies definitely um, were higher titered than the binding antibodies, but they weren't longer lived, and that's what happened. So so once nine months had gone by, the binding antibodies were longer lived than the neutralizing antibodies, and they got into trouble. So I think you know you you, you know you just have to hope that you know that that your neutralizing antibodies are higher titered and longer lived, or you could get into trouble. But again, I mean, these are the kinds of things. That you know, because people are uh, desperate for a vaccine, because we're so terrified, reasonably, by this virus, um, you may not find that out till later. Okay, we're getting close to the hour. Um, maybe, maybe one last question. Um, there, there are a couple of questions on research on adjuvants. Um, how, how is that going? And given lots of different alternatives, it seems like you've got innumerable combinatorial possibilities with lots of different adjuvants, lots of different vaccines. How do you how, how do you pick what's the best adjuvant, and uh, uh, how, how's that all going to go forward? Well, the good news is they're all being tried as we move forward. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the ones I mentioned, I mean, the CPG motif, you know, the QS21, monophosphoryl lipid A, are all being tried. Um, so. I think we'll learn over time. And the other sort of as a corollary to that question, I mean, might it be true that you know that you would that that one vaccine can prime better for another vaccine? You shouldn't just get one vaccine, but get sort of two different vaccines. That that would be your best thing. I I, I think it's going to take us years to sort this out. Really, uh, you know, you're not going to learn this on the fly. I think what what happens next year, and I think we'll have one or more vaccines next year, will be just the beginning of this. And assuming the virus continues to do what it's doing, which is to act like a scourge. Um, then, then we will have, I think, learn over time. We'll see. I don't think this is going to go away like SARS and MERS went away. Um, I was so wrong about this virus at the beginning. I didn't ever imagine it would be this bad. Jeff, I'd like to say Jeff Bergelson did, so he was way ahead of me on that. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, thank you so much for another really interesting lecture. Um, let me invite everyone to applaud uh, digitally. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation.